Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 619 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 23rd of April 2022 as I record this. On today's show I'm talking to Theodora Taylor about her book Seven Figure Fiction which is all about how to tap into universal human needs to make your books irresistible to readers. We also talk about how Theodora went from traditional publishing to indie, about seven-figure ambition, and how she is choosing wide and asset creation over KU and advertising. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, so Orna Ross has a blog post on self-publishing predictions for the 2020s on the Self-Publishing Advice Alliance of Independent Authors blog is a great read and includes further decentralisation of publishing with examples such as Brandon Sanderson's Kickstarter and Katie Cross who makes most of her income selling direct on her website and if you uh, used to listen to the six-figure authors Katie's been on there a couple of times. This also feeds into the prediction that author business models will continue to diversify with different income streams and the continued rise of author collaboration and empowerment. Now, of course, I talk about these futurist themes a lot, but as Orna says, the point of these predictions is not to be right so much as to get authors thinking in the right way about what's ahead. What are the consequences of these trends in our industry? What should a new author consider? A mid-list author? An authorpreneur? Should we be changing or doing anything differently? How do we prepare ourselves for the future? It's important that we don't just go, oh no, something new is happening, and feel stressed or harassed because we think we should be doing everything. The most successful indie authors engage with trends and developments and then intentionally ignore them or intentionally take action depending on their particular value for their particular situation right now. And I really, obviously, I love all the futurist stuff, but I don't love all the futurist stuff, actually. I pick the things, obviously, this is a writing, publishing, authors thing. I don't share a lot of the stuff. For example, I've been reading um, or listening to this book on um, synthetic biology. I'm just not talking about that at all because this is not a synthetic biology show. (laughs) But I I love uh, reading about the future. But I definitely ignore a lot of things. And this is so important because the author community, let alone the rest of life, is filled with information and tips on everything. And if you tried to pick up the tips on all these things, you'd just be drowning in information. You cannot do everything. I'm sorry. (laughs) You have to choose and then intentionally ignore the rest. I think this intentional resistance or intentional ignoring or intentionally saying no, this is something I definitely struggle with, but we all need to do more of. We have to push things away because otherwise we just become overwhelmed and stressed. So if you're someone right now who's overwhelmed and stressed with everything, what do you need to intentionally say no to? For example, I had someone again this week say, why don't I do TikTok? Because it's the place to sell books at the moment. Now, I literally have never even looked at TikTok. I've I've seen a TikTok video when it's been shared on Twitter. But for example, I use Twitter. I don't use TikTok. I don't do video. I stop doing a lot of, I do some video, very, very little video these days. But yes, TikTok might sell books for some people, but I do not have the bandwidth for TikTok as a consumer or as a creator. 
Now, I've obviously built my career on the long-term value of content marketing, not the short-term spike of social media. Podcast interviews with transcripts are discoverable for years and years. Some of you might be listening now in my future, (laughs) even years ahead in my future. And uh, we all have to make our choices about who and what to pay attention to. Now, I tend to go down rabbit holes in order to form an opinion. The last couple of months, I've been down the uh, crypto rabbit hole. And then I decide to ignore or embrace things depending on how I feel about it. If I'm still excited, then I'll be like, yep, I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to do it. If I just, if I move towards something and it repels me in some way, then I just say, right, I'm not going to do that. And this is, it's a kind of combination of looking at signals, listening to things, learning enough to form a opinion that is based on fact instead of emotion. And And then uh, tapping into, then tapping into, I guess, emotion of as to whether I want to continue in that direction or not. So you're going to have to do that uh, as well for yourself. And we're all different people. So that will help. So this questioning attitude also ties into the latest interview on my books and travel podcast with Brianna Media about the unexpected road to an unconventional life. And uh, we question the existing way of living even. And it applies to many areas of our lives because we, we just keep putting ourselves in boxes and thinking that we can't break out. And sometimes we need to take a step back and think, why am I doing things this way? What changes? could I make that will lead me to the place I really want to go and that's on my books and travel podcast on all the usual apps and talking of going down rabbit holes and learning things so you can decide whether or not to embrace them then uh, I highly recommend the latest story bundle on writing craft and writing business at storybundle.com forward slash writing limited time ebook bundle with books ebooks and course It includes publishing pitfalls, writing craft for the working writer, how to use deliberate practice, create a character clinic with Holly Lyle, free your inner nonfiction writer, do quit your day job, a writer prepares by Lawrence Block, how to write clean first draft writing with Dean Wesley Smith. Uh, Dean is a discovery writer and he has a book called Writing into the Dark and this is his course on clean first draft writing when you're a discovery writer, which is awesome. Well, it's not just for discovery writers, of course, um, but yes, I've actually put that on my list to do. (laughs) Plus starting your own business with Christine Catherine Rush and the bundle includes my futurist book, Artificial Intelligence blockchain and virtual worlds, the impact of converging technologies on authors and the publishing industry. You can get all of those ebooks and the course for one special deal. And you can check out the bundle now at storybundle.com forward slash writing. It is only available until around the 10th of May 2022. So yes, go check that out storybundle.com forward slash writing. So in my personal update, I have been sick this week (laughs) with shock horror, a head cold that was not COVID. You can probably hear it in my voice. Uh, But yes, I did test. And uh, who knew there were other viruses other than COVID around? I actually hung out with my nieces who were and my family over Easter weekend, as many of us did. And um, they're five and six years old. (laughs) So when I see them, I often get sick, uh, which is good because, you know, we also have to (laughs) have these other things. But yes, so I've been sick this week haven't got as much done as I would like but in terms of writing I am in the first draft of how to write a novel which is going from chaotic mess to a much more organized draft and yeah I'm I'm really happy to be into it Uh, it's definitely working this time it's it's that moment when we embrace a project when we say yes okay I'm ready I'm gonna do this and it all starts to fall into place I as I've mentioned I I've had that sort of 90,000 word draft since what for for five years or something like that so yeah I'm really committing to it now I am doing the kickstarter I just have to finish the book and get it to my editor first before I decide on the timing 
one of my biggest fears around doing a Kickstarter is somehow disappointing you. Um, you, if you support the Kickstarter, I just don't want to put anything up until I know when I can deliver. I will, I will deliver. It's just I need to know the the timing. Uh, I've also been doing costings on a beautiful limited edition hardback, which will be gorgeous, and that will be seriously limited edition uh, because, um, yeah, I mean, I just want to do a really nice, beautiful book which I've never done before (laughs) as a limited print run. I've only done print on demand. So, well, no, I say that. I have only done print on demand since my very first book back in 2007, early 2008, when I did that first print run of 2000 books, (laughs) which went mostly into the landfill, but they were not beautiful. They were meant to be mass market. That was before print on demand really happened. So yeah, this is, I feel, I feel a lot of fear, but sort of circling back to what I said with Orna's um, blog post, we have to decide what we're going to embrace and what we're not going to do. And I want to embrace doing beautiful books that last longer than eBooks, let's face it. But of course, how to write a novel will be available in ebook. It will be an audio. It will be all of those things. So yeah, more on that later. Uh, this week, I am heading to Arizona for the Creator Economy Expo, which is a blend of Web 2 and Web 3 opportunities across a lot of different creator disciplines, not just authors. There will be authors there, but most people do not run businesses as authors. So I'm really excited to fill my business well this week. I rarely, I mean super rarely, go to a conference where I want to attend every single session. But this is one of those. So And I shall, of course, be sharing some of what I learn with you uh, over time. Say thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. The Rogue of Space said about Jesse's episode, this was an absolutely fantastic podcast episode to listen to and reminds me of an artwork I've been meaning to create called Seeds of a Novel. One of my favourite parts in this discussion was about the Shackleton Prompt short story anthology. Can we make it? (laughs) Yeah, that was actually quite fun. Adam Roach says, it remains day one, quote, such an incredible focus for the day. Thank you for your consistent call to simply stay consistent. And thanks to Cello or Consuelo Burrito on Twitter, who said, catching up on the podcast while getting in a good walk, sent a lovely picture from walking in the woods on Wid." B Island. Brilliant. So you can tweet me at the creative pen. You can send me pictures of where you're listening. Email me joanna at the creative pen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid, which is fantastic given the seven figure fiction topic. Uh, I've also been writing about Pro Writing Aid in How to Write a Novel. It is great for fiction and nonfiction. I use it several times in my writing process, always before sending to my human editor, because I need the book to be the best it can be before I send it to a human. I don't want my human editor to have to deal with stuff I can fix myself with software. I love ProWriting Aid. You have heard me talk about this before. Uh, I use it, as I said, several times after I get my edits back and I make my changes and I use it again before I send it to a proofreader. I just think it's brilliant. It helps with suggestions around passive voice, often an issue, especially in fiction. Things like sentence length variation and complexity, word choice, adverbs, repeated words, dialogue tags, commas, (laughs) as well as wording like you started three sentences in a row with the same word, which of course, sometimes is a craft choice and sometimes is not. (laughs) It has some really useful reports to help you improve your writing and also includes things like pacing. Uh, You can also build a custom style guide, which is super useful if you have a series and you want to make sure you're spelling names or places the same or you want to always choose this way of doing things. I love how I can write in Scrivener and open the project within Pro Writing Aid and it will check the content and update as I write and then save it into the Scrivener project. Pro Writing Aid also has integrations with loads of other writing tools like MS Word, Chrome, Google Docs, etc. It also has a plagiarism checker. Uh, I used to use Grammarly, but I switched to Pro Writing Aid a few years back as it, it is much better fit for me as an author for creative writing and also for longer form writing. And Scrivener integration just made it <laughs> a Grammarly killer in uh, in my mind. 
so you can check out the free edition or get 25% off the premium edition by using my link prowritinga.com forward slash joanna j-o-a-n-n-a that's prowritinga.com forward slash joanna this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting transcription and editing but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons especially the extra in between episodes Thanks to new patrons, Morgana Best and Sue Franklin. And thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. You will get, if you support the show, you get the extra Q&A audio, which I do every month. And uh, you just support the show with a couple of dollars or they have lots of different currencies now. And uh, you'll also get money off my ebooks, audiobooks and courses and other behind the scenes chat. So support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Theodora Taylor is the best-selling author of over 50 books across contemporary sci-fi shifter and interracial romance. She's also the author of Seven Figure Fiction, How to Use Universal Fantasy to Sell Your Books to Anyone under T. Taylor. So welcome, Theodora. Oh, th- thank you for having me, Joanna. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you about this. I bought the book, I think it was last year, and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I, want, <laughs> I want everyone to read this. But first up, <laughs> tell us a bit more about you and your writing journey, and also how you transitioned from traditional to indie publishing. The short version is that I was a writer. Uh, I spent two years pouring my heart and soul into a um, book, a women's fiction novel, and it sold in a um, somewhat splashy deal um, to a traditional publisher. And it got movie in the movie rights sold before it was published. And it was really kind of set up to do great things. And then it just flopped. <laughs> so the movie deal went away, like kind of everything went away. And so I, I had a contract to write a second book. And I spent another two years writing that and promoting the first book, doing things like signings and readings and all that kind of um, stuff they used to have before indie really kind of change what it meant to what releasing a book was. And so I wrote a second book. I sent it to my editor. She sent me back this scathing letter with all the things that were wrong with the book. And <laughs> it was really crushing. I called my best friend and I said, oh, she hated everything except for the sex scenes. I might as well become a romance writer. But then <laughs> <laughs> that became, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe I should become a romance writer. So I um, did my first of what I could now consider many, many experiments throughout my writing career. And I decided, my um, agent said, okay, we're going to send this around to other publishers. And so I did have a contract for a nonfiction book at that point, but it wasn't due to February. So of course you can't like start it <laughs> at a time. You have to push that to the last minute. And I and so I decided that I'd write a book, a romance novel, while she was shopping the novel, it, the second book under my real name. And by the time she sold it and I got paid from the um, publisher who had picked up the second book, I had written four indie books and made way more money than the advance that I was getting. And it was just kind of like, oh, this is where I belong. It was really one of those wonderful things because at that point in my writing career, I felt I had hit rock bottom, that I was a complete failure, that basically my career was over. And Theodore Taylor kind of introduced me to this new side of writing that and it turned out that I liked being Theodore Taylor, one person business, way more than I liked working with traditional in traditional with a traditional publisher. So mm. I guess I just kind of went with Theodore Taylor and I did do like two books for Harlequin, but that kind of only taught me <laughs> that I really prefer to be an indie publisher. 
Oh, it's so great to hear that you enjoy being a one person business. And we're going to come back to that. But I want to return to you said in there, I might as well be a romance writer, which is just one of those comments that people say when they don't understand what the romance genre is like and how incredible the business people are in in the romance genre. But how can we change this kind of stigma of romance and um, make people understand how important it is? I wish you could see me right now because I nodded along with everything you said. I absolutely kind of did view it in a dismissive way. And I think that's because I did not understand how much work this is and how important it is, what what an important role we serve in the um, reading community. And It's one of those difficult things because we kind of know that we provide escape, we provide a way for people to explore some of their um, fantasies that they might not want to explore in real life. We provide all of these things to our readers and our readers really, really love us for it. But the perception of romance by people who aren't unfortunately, in the romance community can be dismissive, in some cases, insulting. And really, I wish that more people were into romance, because it kind of teaches you important lessons about loving and being loved. And uh, I could go on about this forever, but I'm a rambler. So I'll stop myself right there. And I'll just say, I wish that more people did understand romance and what it really brings to the table as far as the reading experience goes. And I also think in terms of the indie community, the romance writers and of course the erotica writers uh, have been well ahead of most of the yes. rest of the genres, right? <laughs> yes. For years. Yes. We're early adopters, so we tend to, like, you know, not that it matters, but we make so much money, (laughs) like, you know, and it's one of these things that to so easily, that some people so easily dismiss us, it's infuriating, just infuriating. Yeah, totally. And look, to be fair, I remember back in sort of 2010-ish, I I also was quite dismissive of romance writers. And then I met some and I realized yes. that they were the smartest business people around. And that yes. com- it completely changed my perception. And I do think that is changing over time. And obviously, you're one of those um, very smart business people. But let's get into the book, um, Seven Figure Fiction. So you talk about universal fantasy, uh, which I think needs explaining because some people might might think that's kind of elves and elves and things. So what, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by universal fantasy? Oh, thank you for giving me that opportunity, because one of the biggest misconceptions are people saying, oh, can people who don't write fantasy, (laughs) who don't write fantasy, I really did not understand about the fantasy genre before I wrote this book, or I might have called it something else. But universal fantasy is basically those fantasies that we have, I would call it universally, um, that a lot, but it could it doesn't have to be completely universal. It just has to be a fantasy that a lot of other people share. So there are some like big, big, big fantasies that like everybody from a three-year-old to a 70-year-old or an older adult share. And those are fantasies like um, people appreciating you, being seen, getting attention. (laughs) Like those are kind of universal fantasies. Having somebody who's really worthy fall in love with you, things like that. Those are universal fantasies. And how is that different to tropes? I mean, I think we talk about tropes a lot more in the fiction space. So give us some examples of a trope compared to a universal fantasy. So the difference between tropes in universal fantasies is that trope is kind of the umbrella and universal fantasy is what makes that trope so, so, so delicious. A great example that I just watched with my own kids is Turning Red. And so have you, I don't know if you've seen that movie, if, if, if it's released in the UK. It's no, the no, I haven't seen it yet. Disney cartoon. Mm. 
<laughs> and it's this great um, mother-daughter film. And so when we say, oh, hey, it's a mother-daughter film, what do we mean by that? It could be anything that's a huge trope, mother-daughter stuff. We could all name a mother-daughter film, a mother-daughter um, a mother-daughter um, book, a mother-daughter television show. So what do we mean with Turning Red? Like what, why is, what did Turning Red do for the mother-daughter trope that what Universal Fantasies <laughs> made this mother-daughter film just really land with audiences? So we have Universal Fantasies within Turning Red, like learning your parents' secrets helping your mother in some way, like kind of proving yourself as an adult, which my middle schooler <laughs> and my middle school person um, in my house is always trying to get us to give her more responsibility to treat her like a fellow adult, even though she's 12. So that kind of idea that you get to make your own choices, that you do have what it takes to make your own decisions. It's, that's a universal fantasy for a lot of us. And another one that I really loved from that film was, oh yeah, basically making your mother see you with a, uh, see you as an adult, getting to decide for yourself and freedom from your mother. Like what that film is ultimately about is someone getting the freedom to live life on her terms. And so there are a lot of mother-daughter films that have these um, universal fantasies, but this is what made Turning Red. These particular fantasies were what made Turning Red a particularly great mother-daughter film. Well, let's unpack that more because I think, and I wish you'd used another word as well, because again, fantasy in the romance genre can mean kind of sexual fantasy. Yes. And, and that's not what you're talking about at all. So to me, it's almost like a sort of psychological, emotional aspects of story that make each of us go, yes, I feel something about yes. that. So some of those things you were saying, you know, obviously I have uh, a mother, it's Mother's Day here in the UK yesterday, and there are the good mother-daughter things and the difficult mother-daughter things that are kind of yes. in inevitable. But just to pick, let's pick another genre to help people. So I write action adventure thrillers and I watch a lot of those types of movies as well, you know, like a sort of Lara Croft thing. So a ah. trope. So an example of a trope might be finding an ancient relic in a tomb, right? That makes all the action adventure people go, yay, that's mm. find a relic in a tomb. But the emotional side of it might be good overcoming evil, like Indiana Jones beating the Nazis to the Ark of the Covenant. Is, is that an, another example or have I got that wrong? Um, <laughs> no, like really what is this about? I think action adventure is so interesting because a lot of action adventures, like you say, is about finding the thing that will solve everything, right? And really it's about like the fantasy there is you are the one who solves everything by finding the thing. <laughs> so that's the fantasy that you, that you, and I talk a lot about characters being avatars for the reader, but that your avatar finds this thing and solves some problem some big problem and I like the the characters are avatars for the reader and of course <laughs> I write my character Morgan Sierra is like my alter ego so basically what we're saying is that I want to save the world and thus I write a character <laughs> who saves who the can world. save the world yes yes but I guess with further breakdowns like it, it's always great to go over just like real examples because what will saving the world do for you? Like, what will it do for your character? What fantasy will it complete, if you will? So if you save the world, and that means that your father is proud of you, finally, <laughs> withholding father is oh, proud no, I'm going to cry. Because, right. <laughs> That's the fantasy that saving the world realizes. So like saving the world is a trope, but within that saving the world trope, you can put in a lot of universal fantasies that will make that trope way big, way better. And it won't be just kind of like, because I think we've all watched action adventure films where it's like, 
oh, we must get the thing, car chase, car chase, car chase. There is an obstacle to getting the thing, car chase, car chase, car chase. And we've gotten the thing and the credits are rolling and we feel nothing, <laughs> you know, mm. whereas an uh, action film where some like big evil is overcome, like seeing Nazis melt, their face melt, <laughs> that's very satisfying <laughs> for a lot of people, right? And yeah. so it's just kind of like, I didn't just vanquish an enemy, I vanquished the Nazis in this kind of, in this kind of roundabout way. So vanquishing a huge enemy that's a huge universal better and to do it that well, where it's just like, oh, I melted their faces. We all remember (laughs) how these particular Nazis died. And what's interesting is throughout our movie history, lots and lots of Nazis have been killed, but we remember, we all remember how those particular Nazis died. So I think they did a really good job of not only kind of tapping in to that universal fantasy of like really vanquishing a big enemy, but like having them die horribly. Mm. Yeah, I think what I love about your book, because there's a lot of writing books, but I do feel like you have tapped into this emotional side of things that I personally, I definitely struggle with, as in, i.e. much happier writing plot and theme. Same, and same. S- setting so (laughs) okay well then well that's interesting so how did you because I kind of thought oh well maybe you're just naturally empathetic like how did you learn to see these universal fantasies behind the sort of tropes is there something you did or, or did you have you just literally gone deeper and deeper for years well I was I would say like one of the most wonderful fan notes that I get from authors is this is all stuff I knew. (laughs) It feels like you broke something like that you turned on a light in like a room. I didn't know I had, like, I knew this. I just didn't know I know this. And it's making, it's making writing easier because I think in the back, of our minds, a lot of us are just kind of like, okay, I'm writing a good plot. I'm writing a good trope. All the elements are there, but there's kind of something missing. Like there's a um, disconnect with audience, uh, or I don't know that an audience is going to like this. So um, in the book, I kind of explain what happened. I paid for a really expensive, it, not really expensive, it was worth every penny, <laughs> but for me at the time, as where I was as an author, I paid for what I felt was an expensive class. And I realized that my, that I would have to advertise this to a uh, audience beyond my original target audience. So my target audience, I write interracial romance. So my target audience is a pretty easy audience to pick out. It's like, oh, Black women who are either in interracial relationships or want to read an interracial romance. But in this case, I went through the Facebook settings and this, it was really bad. Like they don't even have an author <laughs> in my genre that I could target. So they only had like kind of these huge, mostly traditional authors that you could target. And so we're getting kind of all this advice for this class. And I just realized that, oh, I had to figure out why people like the book I was trying to advertise on a universal level, as opposed to, hey, um, target audience. This is a book. You like interracial romance. This is an interracial romance book. You will probably like this book. And so that really, once I kind of realized, oh, there are universal fantasy elements to every novel or every piece of entertainment that works or has a lot of love that you, that appeals to audience. When I figured that out, it was easier to write books. It was easier to market my books and it was easier to connect with an audience when I thought about it in terms of, oh, you're telling a story around a fire. What will keep that audience engaged? What will make that audience come to the fire when you say, hey, I've got a story about so-and-so because 
like there's a difference between calling an audience to the fire with, oh, hey, I've got, if we're like, say we're cavemen, oh, hey, I've got a story about today's hunt versus um, saying to the audience, I've got a story about today's hunt and in which our greatest warrior almost died, would have died if not for the efforts of our weakest warrior. Then all the people (laughs) are coming to the fire to hear this story because you've just given them some universal fantasy. It's like, wait, the strongest warrior almost died and he would have died if not for the weakest warrior intervening and I'm weak in some way. The weak person turns out to be the hero. This is just tapped into a universal fantasy. Yes, I will come listen to your story around the fire. Mm. So that's kind of what universal fantasy is. Yes. And I I read the book in on Kindle and I've bought a hard copy because I and people listening, if you feel this way, like I've I feel like I need to read it over and over again and to work <laughs> out what it, what am I because I totally get what you're saying. And yet I cannot figure out in my own books what they are and what I need. And because we write the books we need. Right. And we, right. we, watch, we watch the things that, that satisfy us in some way. So I think I think it's, it's almost like a know yourself but also know your reader and I wanted to just come back on the interracial romance thing because I love that you basically discovered that it's not just people in mixed race marriages or whatever it's also just people yes. who like <laughs> stories and I mean yes. Brid- have you seen I mean Bridgerton Bridgerton is a great example like we just have you seen the latest series of Bridgerton I'm watching it right now I'm on episode four yeah and yeah so it's I'm so good very upset, <laughs> very, <laughs> upset right now. very upset With- yeah and I think I'm meant to be, but I'm going to keep on going, even though I'm upset at things that have happened in episode four. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's what's so funny is my husband's far more romantic than I am. But we end up yesterday, we binge watched like five hours because we couldn't stop watching because we were like, no, yes. stop doing that. No, stop yes. doing that. And it's just like, how, how did, how, just incredible storytelling. But of course, Bridgerton, if people don't know, if people listening, it is an entirely multiracial cast right it's really quite su- super diverse and it doesn't matter like it really doesn't matter we're there for the story not right. the differences between people and of course that it's important as well but I love that you sort of went do you know what it's not just about this thing it could be much much bigger and so often we get trapped in demographics you know women between 45 and 65 right. like this type of book and it's, <laughs> it's like not true right no, it, it, it's somewhat, it's, so I always say both are true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Women true. between 40 and 55 really like your book about witches, middle-aged witches. They just love it, right? It, but at the same time, maybe w- women who are younger than that will love your book about middle-aged witches because a it's about women overcoming something society have put up on them and or a woman or maybe they'll be interested because I because something happens on a universal level that kind of speaks to a fantasy within themselves and the like and so really what this book is saying is that your audience is much bigger than you think it is because I think one of the things um people do is just kind of like, they'll say something like, oh, I write romance. So, you know, women won't be, or men won't be interested in it. This person won't be interested in it. This person won't be interested in it. And in actuality, it's just kind of like, if you say, oh, hey, I write about werewolves and these big things are happening in their village, you know, you in their within their path and there's intrigue and there's this this and this universal fantasy then a lot of different it opens up your audience and it says to your audience yes this is for me but at the same time one of the things that Bridgerton does so well is they're saying oh hey if you if you've ever wanted to take part in a Regency romance 
all of you are represented in this Regency romance, which is something I had not seen before. It's kind of like they're saying they obviously understand that it does matter, that represent- representation does matter, but they also know that everyone will watch because we're all in it for this um, fantastic story that kind of appeals to us on a universal level. Yes, I actually think Bridgerton is hugely important. And and in fact, talking of uh, books and acceptance, I live in Bath in the southwest of England where Bridgerton uh-huh. is filmed. A lot of it is filmed. Oh, wow. Here. Yeah, in the Georgia, because we have the, all the Georgian architecture. But what's so funny is a very literary town and they're very, they're quite snobby really about books. But the local bookstore, the window is full of Julia Quinn's Bridgerton of books. Of course, of course. <laughs> and it's so interesting with that kind of stuff because it's just kind of like oh towns like to be represented they're probably very proud that it's their town in this movie in a like like a lot more people will pick that up because it's it's that yeah exactly yeah it's really funny but right, I want to change tack a little bit because I wanted to come back on the business side you mentioned in mm-hmm. the beginning that you enjoy being a one-person business what I love is that well the book is called seven figure fiction and you are your confidence just jumps off the page I love it I love reading confidence um, around business as well as writing but um if authors are you know, you said at the beginning that you had failure at the beginning how do authors get to this level of confidence that they can make a business work? How have you grown into that attitude? Or did you always have that attitude? I honestly, I feel like with authors, one of the main things they don't give themselves is time. Like one of the things I really loved about your book is that you broke down how you entered the business, how you studied the business, um, your book on um, nonfiction. <laughs> and it was in how you transitioned into the business. And it wasn't like, oh, so I decided to become a writer. And then the next day, I just knew everything there was to be <laughs> to yeah. become a writer. And with, um, it, it, they're often called baby authors. It's always, it, they'll, they'll ask me for advice that I feel is, a matter of time like it's just kind of like well how do you um get all these people to read your book and a lot of that is just kind of saying is just learning to consistently (laughs) turn out books to develop the audience it's kind of boring which is (laughs) because it's basically like oh my best business advice is to do the business and to learn and to fail and to just keep on going no matter what, just Mm. keep going. And so I don't think that I'm um, particularly confident. I just kind of have learned what I've learned and I just keep on going. (laughs) Like that's the main thing that I know just statistically, if I keep on going and I stay consistent and and by consistent, I mean, just put out because I'm not that consistent of a writer, but I do try to put out like a series every year and things like that. So if I keep on doing that, I, I will eventually reach my goal. I might do it sooner than projected, but eventually I will if I just kind of keep on going. And it's interesting with the keep on going thing, like are the keep on swimming memes, because really it's, that's the hardest part. (laughs) Like it's, I don't know if you've ever been discouraged within your writing career, but the keep on going piece, it's like, it's three words, but it's the hardest part of this business because a lot of times we feel like, um, I think every writer has woken up and they're supposed to write this book and they've in, they certainly suspect that they've forgotten how to write. <laughs> they, they, even though they've written like 10 or 20 books, they're just, they're just suspicious that they're not a good writer, that this has somehow all been a fluke and things like that. And that's hard with that when you're dealing with something like that to 
keep on writing and to put out books anyway, even if you're not confident or confident. So uh, again, I've fallen to another ramble, but <laughs> many points keep on going. Yeah. And I love that. And I agree with you. Someone said to me the other day, oh, well, you know a lot more than you realize that you know, because <laughs> the longer you're in this game, right? We read so yes. many books, we listen to people and we sometimes we don't realize we know what we know and we just take it for granted what we're doing after so many years. And people do look us look at us and say, well, how do you do that? And it's like, well, I just learned like you will learn. <laughs> right. And I think the big thing is kind of not value, valuing what we know. So one of the things with um, Universal Fantasy, it was uh, this kind of funny situation because I had this group back when I lived in California, a group of um, my fellow Californian writers, and I would meet like in November or December, right before the big big holiday break. And we would basically spend like four days in a beach house and we would say, okay, everybody has to teach something. They have to teach something that they know. And this first year I did one little class and the second year I was just like, you know, I don't, (laughs) I don't really have much that I know. And there were some kind of like big hitters coming to the conference because we always invited people outside of our group to come just teach us for an hour. One thing, you know, like teach one, do one workshop. And I was like, but I do know how to sell books to people outside of my audience. And so I presented it and it was this kind of crazy thing where it juggernauted and RWA was just like chapter was just kind of like, could you come present that to us? And so I did. And then people kept on hearing it and it was just kind of like, oh, it's this thing that I know, but I wouldn't have necessarily put value on it until I started teaching other people (laughs) this thing that I know. And I think a lot of women in general do that. It's just like, oh, a lot. You're good at business, but they don't necessarily give themselves the credit. Yeah, absolutely. Really looking at what we know and making sure we're using that. But I also wanted to ask, so back to the seven figure fiction, and you do say in the beginning of the book, I'm not a seven figure author, but Mm -hmm. you're a a multi six figure author, as am I. And you clearly have this aspiration for seven figures, which I also do. And I love talking about ambition because people often shy away from it. They, they won't admit to it, whereas I actually think most authors have some kind of ambition, right? So That's I'm, the best thing about being an indie romance writer, because it's like, and it's interesting because I have a lot of friends who are outside this business, and so many of them are not okay with ambition. <laughs> if you're ambitious and you want to find another group of women who are also ambitious, it's like romance writers. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's really encouraging. I mean, I'm I'm one of those women, but I don't write romance. So, <laughs> I mean, I, and it's funny in the thriller. I think in the thriller niche, there's a lot more traditionally published authors, so it's it's a mm-hmm. bit it's a bit different. But I did want to ask you because I feel like your business, like my business, is is a mature business. Let's say we've been around a while, and I I feel like there's a step up between a multi six figure business and a seven figure business. So, what are you doing to take your author business to the next level, or are you doing something different or planning to do something different or is it as you said earlier is it just keep on keeping on okay so this should come with the caveat this is what I'm doing (laughs) this is not a suggestion for what other people should do I um was very very privileged last year to come to a precipice where of like the limits of what I could do with what I had, if you will. And so I made it to like number 10 in the Amazon store with a KU book. And so I said to myself, okay, I'm looking at all the other people who are around me right now, and they are spending serious, serious banks on ads. But here's the other thing. (laughs) I have two other books do in this series in series and I really kind of immediately need to be writing and also 
I am just more of a writer than I am an ad person or something like that. So it was just kind of like, you could do a huge spin on ads and like you could really level yourself up because that's literally the difference. (laughs) You know, once you start getting into kind of like the really low numbers, it was just a ton, uh, there's just a ton of ads been going on. Or you can really, 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 really think about the organic ways that other non-KU authors reach that seven-figure platform that might be more in line with how you do business. Because the way I do business is that I write a book, I market a book for maybe a few days, and then I'm back to writing a book. And um, almost nobody who's really great at marketing would suggest that you do business that way, but that's kind of where I'm at. So I decided that I would need to, in order to hit my goals, is to go wide, first of all, like just be in more places, do more long-term investment, things like audiobook, German, and basically have a lot of different income streams going. And that's been really interesting because it's the money I would have invested in ads, say, are now going into just making sure that I have money coming in from all these different places. And it really adds up and I'm really liking it. And I'm not at my goal yet, but I'm doing pretty well (laughs) so far this year and the like. And so it's just kind of like, well, I think I'll hit this goal, this um, seven-figure goal in one year. To be clear, I have made seven figures (laughs) over the course of my author Mm. career, but I think I'll hit a seven-figure year in the next year or two by um, making sure that my audiobook program is great, my German program is great, that I'm translating, that I'm doing kind of all of these things to establish my author career, establish myself in other places. And for every author, I would say the big thing is, my. it's funny, I'm pre, um, reading this book by my really good friend, Maggie Marr. It's called Books to Film. And it's, it's a great guide that I'm just excited to blurb about how authors can get their books to film. And her main thing, like the first thing she says is, there is no one way to get your book to film. And then she proceeds to show you like all the different ways that people, the authors have gotten their books to film. And that's how I feel about the whole seven figure goal. Like, you know, there are authors who really like just kill, kill it on ads and have hit seven figure. There are authors who kill. And what's interesting to me is some authors are just like, Oh man, I learned Facebook ads and I became a seven figure author. Some authors are like, Oh man, I just kill it on Amazon ads. And I became a seven figure author. And then I took this one author's class where she was just kind of like, well, I just figured, um, the more income streams I have, the better. So I just really invested in self. And I was just like, I think that's the path I want to take. And so it's whatever resonates with you. So just saying, oh, hey, I'm mostly a writer. I would rather be writing most of the time. That's where I feel most comfortable. And so for me, having my writing in more places is going to work for me. But there are other authors who are just, great at ads, have the attention span for ads and stuff Mm. like that. And that's where they should be. So that's why I said, this is what I decided to do versus who knows what whoever is listening to this should do, but Mm. really kind of think about it for yourself and just have a goal and have a plan. So whatever plan you come up with is better than no plan or just being like, I hope one day. (laughs) I'll get that. No, that is brilliant. Right. And I'm actually thrilled you said that because I talk about multiple streams of income. And basically what you're doing is creating assets that bring you money for exactly. the long term rather than spending that money on ads. So assets, not ads is what you do. But you're right. It's up to the individual. So uh, as ever, this is just a discussion rather than um, sort of direct <laughs> advice. 
Please but don't say Theodora and Joanna told you to do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this has been brilliant. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? TheodoraTaylor.com um, for my fiction stuff and seven figurefiction.com for everything seven figure fiction in this book and you can also find me on facebook or on instagram and tiktok dm me if you have any questions i'm always glad to hear from people so brilliant thank you ahead of time if you get in contact brilliant well thanks so much for your time theodora that was great Oh, thank you, Joanna. You do so much for the community. So I cannot express to you what an honor it was to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. So I hope you found the interview with Theodora inspiring and interesting. And I definitely recommend her book, especially if you're writing fiction. Next week, I discuss Tiny Business, Big Money with Elaine Pofelt. And that title got me right away because that's definitely how I see my perfect author business. So that's coming next week. And in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.